If everyone wants to stand as we go back to worship, as we pray, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the day and all your many blessings, God. Lord, just thank you for this opportunity for us to be in um, your house this morning, God. Lord, I just pray that our hearts be vulnerable to your word and to your song, God. Lord, I pray that we truly listen to each and every word of this song, Lord, and allow your Holy Spirit just to flood through us, God. Lord, in Jesus' name.
this time to children's church with their teachers. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And most of all, to the Father. Because without Him, we couldn't even be here. Sometimes I think we concentrate on earthly more than we concentrate on the real Father. And to think that He created us for one. For two is He, he designed us so complex that that there's no other way you can describe the Big Bang Theory doesn't describe it, the, the, uh, the, the evolution doesn't describe it, nothing. To know how complex God made us. And He did that for a reason, because He loved us. And He created us to live forever. And this week, uh, we're continuing in First Peter. And I don't, uh, I try my best not to um, do a sermon just because it's Father's Day. Father, Father's Day. I prayed throughout the week and asked God to direct me and He direct me. We're going to continue in, in 1 Peter and finish out chapter 2. And there is a lot of meeting but a huge message um, that I hope you get today. Not from me, but from Him. And so if you would turn your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And I'm titled the message, In His Hands. <clears throat> In His Hands. <clears throat> the Word of God says, You are slaves. You who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they're kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when, conscious of His will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Now I want you to point out something to you there. Realize what that said. There's an important three or four words there. Anybody see that? Anybody see what that is? It's separated by, by that's right, separated by commas. For us to realize that. So, for, for God is pleased, now if you take that out, for God is pleased when you patiently endure unjust treatment. If you take that out, then we serve a God that's really kind of hateful, right? We serve a God that says, hey, I want you to suffer unjust treatment. But that's not what Peter said. Peter says, For God is pleased when, conscious of His will, you patiently endure unjust, unjust treatment. So what does that tell us? It goes back to the whole thing of, it's His will, not ours. And that sometimes He, he wills it for us to go through things to make us stronger for the next one to come along. Or, or endure things and, and endurance. And you know what? What makes you stronger? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? How many of y'all seen that uh, uh, America's Got Talent or whatever and all that stuff? And, that one, one of them was, I can't remember which one it was, there was three golden buzzers that I saw, but one of them was where they played that song, What Does It Kill You Makes You Stronger. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was from the young man that was bullied in school. And uh, they played that at the end, and I thought to myself, man, you know what? Imagine how kids have to feel. Imagine how people have to feel and know that they endure those things. But to see where that young man's at now and see what happens. You know? So endurance. Endurance builds strength in us. Amen? <clears throat> Verse 20. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for good, for doing good, and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you. I want to point out something to you there that, that God opened my eyes to this week, and I hope that maybe it'll speak to you. But do you realize that, that Jesus wasn't the only one that really suffered horrendously in the Bible? You realize there was another man in the Old Testament? And, and, and I want you to think about something. When we think about what is the purpose for our life, what's my life purpose? What's my life purpose? Do you realize what Job's purpose was? To suffer the most horrific punishment of, of detriment to his body. Sores. Wife turning on him. Friends turning on him. All, that, all those things. He, but he still set the example and stayed that. And understand, I'm not, he's not Jesus, and I'm not comparing him to Jesus by no means. But, but I heard this this week, and I thought, man, that's so true. One of the pastors I've listened to, I like to listen to this as a, as a blog, pastors, pastors on Perspective, and, 
and people call in and ask questions and all this stuff and things and, and I was listening to it and, and, and the guy said, this lady called in and she talked about this disease she had and how, how tremendous this disease was and it attacked her whole body and she had it for years and it's no cure for it and it, I mean sickly things she talked about that she had. And all of a sudden the guy goes, <clears throat> typical kind of response on too, and he goes, uh, well I don't know kind of what you're going through and I don't really understand that part, but here I, I struggle with drinking and I struggle with, with, with uh, lust of the flesh and I struggle with this and that and I struggle with, with uh, addiction and all these things and I struggle, I had, a, I had a meeting and I thought to myself, that's what we do. That's what we do. When somebody comes to us and tells us about the problem, and tells us what they got going on, we want to tell them ours. And truth be known, what he really, what he really should have said is, you know what? I have no idea what you're dealing with, man. And I don't, I won't know. But something he said was really true to her, and I thought, man, that's some great advice. He said, one thing I remind myself is that no matter how tough the situation I'm in, no matter how bad it is in my life, there's always somebody in the Bible that had it worse than I did and endured it. That's the thing. Not only did Job have all that stuff happen to him, but he endured it. He endured it. And what happens in the end when he endured it? Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember the story? He lost it. He wasn't just blessed, though. Doubly blessed. But you got to understand something, guys. There's, there's a difference here. He wasn't just blessed. He was blessed to breathe. He was blessed to, to get through that. He was blessed to get rid of the sickness that he had and all the things that happened to him, the boils on his body and all. That was a blessing in itself, okay? But then all of a sudden he got double what he'd had before, oxen, and, 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 and his, all ten of his children died, right? I want you to imagine how tough that is to stay focused on God. So we don't really have it as bad as we think we do at times, do we? God's still dealing with me on that. And it's tough. Life's tough, Right? Right? But if you suffer for doing good, if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you, He is your example. And you must follow in His steps. His steps. He's, he's taught me. I don't want to be like any other preacher. I don't want to be like... This person is a Christian or that person is a Christian or, oh, they got such a closer walk. Oh, I want to be like him. No, I don't. I want to be like him. I want to be like him. I hope you do. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always, not sometimes, not here and there, always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in His body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By His wounds you are healed. No matter what. You're a child of God, you're going to be healed. No matter what your sickness is, you're going to be healed. One way or another, here or there. Amen? Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have Turned to your shepherd, capital S, Jesus, the guardian of your soul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And I thank you, God, for grace and mercy. I thank you, God, for the ability to speak today, God. I thank you, God, for the ability to serve you and, and what you called me to do, Lord. And as failures, I am God, you, you're even greater. And God, thank you, Lord, that when I'm at my worst, you're at your greatest. Thank you, God, that as I decrease, Lord, may you increase in my life. May you have your will and way, God, always. Thank you for being the best daddy that we could ever have. To love us unconditionally, no matter what. Pray, God, that you would speak to us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Just by background, in the, in the Greco-Roman world, people became slaves by being captured in wars, kidnapped, kidnapped, or some were even born, just born into slavery. But others were facing such bad economic situations, so they, they, were, they were horrible life, they couldn't pay their bills, they couldn't do things, so what did they do? They sold themselves into slavery. They tried to do something. They were that desperate. <clears throat> These slaves were under the control of their masters, and they had no independent existence. 
according to S. Scott Barchi in his contribution on slavery in the New Testament <clears throat> to the Anchor Bible Dictionary. I encourage you to take notes, write that down, go check that out. That was really cool in, in reading and studying that this week. But there are many places in Scripture that admonish slaves to submit to their masters, not just here. And so if it's repeated in Scripture, what does that mean? It's important. Listen up and, and apply it. Okay? Take notes. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Colossians 3, 22 through 25. 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 2. Titus 2, 9 through 10. And Philemon. All of them. Safe for slaves to submit to their masters. Many people ask today why New Testament writers and did not criticize slavery or attempt its overthrow. The young churches of the New Testament would be fighting a consensus of the Greco-Roman world, and any such attempt or revolution or anything would be would be in vain. It would be pointless. You got to understand they were going against all these. So imagine this. Imagine, imagine right now that we just at Sharpsburg Community Church wanted to wanted to to, to change the federal government and the laws of saying that, that marriage is only between a man and a woman. Would we really be able to do that? Obviously not, because in the state of North Carolina we voted on it. And, and the voters passed, and it passed, and all of a sudden one judge comes in and says, no, it's not that way. So, you know, they, they, here's what they did. And this is the same thing with us. Sometimes we've got to refocus. Sometimes we've got to refocus. We must remember that the New Testament, New Testament addresses readers in the situation in which they live. The New Testament does not address us where it wants us to be, where we were before, it addresses us right where we're at right now. The church. Not the walls, the body. The writers of the New Testament scriptures did not believe that overhauling social structures would transform culture. Their concern was the relationship of individuals to God, and they focused on the sin and rebellion of the individuals against their Creator. This was their focus. Same thing for us. Because when we sin, what are we doing? It's a rebellion against God, isn't it? If God is not for sin and we sin, then obviously what we're doing is rebelling against Him. And yes, we are sinners, but He saved us by the grace of God through, through our faith in, in His Son, Jesus Christ. It's really simple. When a guy's called in the other day, I was listening to a guy said, yeah, you know, I'm just wondering about this, you know, um, you know, you got to live it and everything or you're really not a Christian and blah, blah, and all this stuff. And the guy said, hold on a minute, man. He said, I want you to understand something. Salvation is that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead. You're saved. Living it out. Living it out is sanctification. We're, we're being molded into what He wants us to be. But we don't all of, all of a sudden, as soon as we get saved, everything's all right with us. And it never will be until He comes back. Amen? Therefore, just as Peter does, many New Testament writers concentrate instead on godly response on the godly response of believers to mistreatment. This is where Peter's at. He's like, hey, don't respond the way you want to respond. Respond in a godly way, the way God desires for us to respond. So three ways Peter tells us to, to live in this scripture. And three ways we look at it today. Number one is living in the situation. Living in the situation for your own sake. Remember last week? What was it? What was the, the title you might remember? For God's sake, not for Pete's sake, right? For God's sake. So this week, really, you could, you could, I could have titled it this, and for your sake. This is for mine and your sake. So Peter's already told us last week, and we've talked about what to do for God's sake, and this is for God that we're doing it. Now he's telling us this week, hey, this is what you got to do for you. This is what I got to do for me. This is what we got to do where God wants us to be at, and what He wants us to live in, and what He wants us to deal with. And here's the thing: for your own sake, you must. Surrender to authority. This is tough for us. It's tough. It's tough for us to surrender to authority. We don't want somebody to have authority over us because we want to be able to do whatever we want to do when we want to do it and how we want to do it and where we want to do it and the way we want to do it. That's humanistic of us. It's our flesh. It's our flesh. We surrender to authority by submitting with respect and obedience. Because you, and I quote from the scripture in, in verse 18, fear God actually is the original manuscript reads in that verse. Fear God. What does that mean? It doesn't mean to be afraid of Him, right? We talked about it last week. What does it mean to fear God? 
Respect Him. And know that He holds everything. Know that He created everything. Know that there's a reason for everything. It's so easy to get mad, isn't it? But really it does no good. But as we'll see, His anger is just. Amen? No matter how they treat you, Peter says in verse 18, and I quote, even if they are cruel. Even if they're cruel. Submit and respect authority no matter what. Endure tough situations. You're living in a situation, endure a tough situation. Why? Because it's going to pass. The worst thing you've ever been through in your life, and you, those memories you'll stay with forever. Some of you, like myself, remember you know, when, when your parents separated and, and, and you're sitting there. I can still remember vividly. I'm 46, and I can still remember vividly at three years old. Sitting in the corner of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the dining room or kitchen or whatever it was there on, on Franklin Street. Still remember. Things get etched in your memory. But here's the thing. He told us, you know what? He uses that for a reason. He uses that for His glory and for, for His honor. And for us to reach out to someone else that says, hey, you know what? Let me, let me just make sure you understand this this morning. If you get nothing else, get this. You're, you've been through situations so that God can use you to help others go through that same situation. It's a purpose. There's a purpose. We're going through situations. We go through situations in our life so that we can help others go through that same situation. Don't we? I mean, I don't know about you, but I want to sit down with teenagers and go, hey, listen to me. Stop all the loving mess and crap that you're doing. Because that's really what it is. Ain't it really other way to describe it? Forgive me if that offends you. But that really is it's a bunch of crap to think you're really in love, honestly. You're not. I love you, but you're not. It's not. It's puppy love. I promise you, it's going to change. And I want so bad to say to him, hey, listen to me. Save yourself a lot of hurt. Right, adults? Save yourself a lot of hurt. Man, if I had tears, if I had money for every tear I cried over a girl breaking my heart, boy, I would be so rich today. <laughs> Man, though, right, my girl? Just messing. But, but here's, here's the thing. It, 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 this is where we're at. We, we, we can't tell them that, though. Do they listen? No, no we didn't listen either. But you know what? Sometimes we go through those situations for a reason because when, when maybe now that one of the teenagers is going through that and they go through a breakup and everything, maybe one of us who've been through that can say to them, hey, yeah, come here and let me talk to you about this. Or maybe, just maybe, God will ordain it where they will come to us. That they'll feel comfortable enough to come to us and talk to us about anything. Let's As Peter says in, in verse 19, God is pleased when we endure unjust treatment. Not just for the sake of unjust treatment, but the key phrase in verse 19 is conscious of whose will? His. When we respond to mistreatment out of the conscience of, of the will of God, it's always right. Our actions should always be depicted by the will of God and not of man. Well, I'd love to say that mine, but mine, mine, have, mine have been more depicted by man than they have from God. Honestly, I confess that to you. My actions have been depicted by more of what man says or does or desires or whatever than it does what God does. And that's not where he wants to say. Especially in the tough situations. Don't forget, man is watching us. And we represent the king. Not a king. We represent the king. People are watching. They're watching. I guarantee you. I guarantee you. I, I, I know a person one time, and, and I thought about this week, I thought I was, I was listening to something, and I heard someone say, oh, well, don't, preachers shouldn't share stories and all this stuff and everything. Just preach the word. Just, just do it. And don't, don't share anything personal and all that and everything. So I don't know how to do that. So if that offends you, I'll do that. I'm sorry. But, but I can tell you, that when I watched a, a young man in, in our in our area get into some trouble and, and he and he did something he shouldn't have done and it got plastered in the newspaper because you know they love to tell all the bad stuff. I'll never forget hearing people talk about 
Oh, did you know what he did? Did you know he did this? Oh my goodness, did you know what? Oh, that's so nasty what he did. And now, and here's the thing. You know why we judge that? Because we don't struggle with that scene. Instead of saying, hey, you know what? Here's what man's doing. Man's sitting back and watching and saying, oh, I thought he said he was a Christian. So why do you do that? I watched a video here recently that was really kind of funny, but it was like, it was really sad. They were poking fun, a man stood up in the pulpit area and was giving a testimony and said that he had been with prostitutes over and over. That's how he met his wife. He didn't want his wife to stop doing it because, because that's how he met her. And all of a sudden, the guy, the comedian that was talking about it said, you need to screen people to get in that pulpit to give you testimonies. Come on, Pastor. It was funny. But the truth of the matter is this. What do you think if that young man stood there and said that? What do you think? You could hear the congregation go, Oh, Lord, no, he did. What did he say? Why? Because people thrive and hang on negative. And they're watching. And the world is watching to see how we respond. How does the Christian respond when something bad happens in their life? How, how, does, it, how do they respond? They're watching us. They're watching us to see. When we endure the tough situations, we come through that other side, it doesn't matter what they think about us. What matters is what our testimony shows and what the Lord knows. We live in a situation to be patient. Be patient while doing the right thing. I know we don't like patience. I don't either. Somebody told me Rome wasn't built today. I hate Rome. <laughs> I want to be built right now, don't y'all? Everybody wants to know. See you ladies in here with your hair fixed today. You look nice. I wish I, wish I had hair. <laughs> I could go buy some. Amen, brother. We're together. But you know what? It doesn't happen. Things don't happen overnight. We don't become we don't become we don't become super Christian overnight either. But he still called us to do the right thing. Peter says in verse 20, of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Church, can I tell you one thing? God is the only one you gotta please. The only one. Period. We try to please ourselves. We try to please our spouse. We try to please our parents. We try to please our friends. We try to please our, our brothers and sisters. We try to please strangers to come up because we want to just that's 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 what we do. And that's not a bad thing. Until it happens that we're worried more about pleasing them than we are about pleasing God. If patient endurance of wrong treatment comes our way while we're doing what is right, God is pleased. And it will be for our own sakes, for our own good. So why are we to live in our situation and do good? Peter tells us in verse 21, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. Why do I have to do good in this situation, God? Because He told us to. It's the Word of God told us to. It's our roadmap. It's our instruction for life. It's our, it's our owner's manual of our bodies. It's what He's called us to do. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. I tend to forget sometimes that, that when I went through my sickness and things that I've had, and, you know, I tend to forget sometimes that, that as much a roller coaster as it may be sometimes, that I realized in suffering, that's one more place I'm joining Jesus Christ. I forget that so easy. I forget that when I'm suffering, I want to concentrate on the suffering. I don't know about you, but maybe you're the same boat. You concentrate on the suffering and the negative things going on in our life. And we wonder why we're suffering and we forget Jesus suffered and we forget also too that that is one more place we're joining. And do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, if Jesus loves unconditionally and you love unconditionally, you're just like Him in that. You with me? If He suffered and you're suffering, you're just like Him in suffering. You know what? I, what? What God really astounds me is, is that this. I can be just like Him and I may not be perfect. Yes. In the suffering, I can be exactly like Him. Exactly like Him. 
I can be so heartbroken over sin in, 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 in my life just as much as he was heartbroken over sin in my life. And I can suffer and endure because what is impossible with man is always possible with God. Secondly, live as the example. Verse 22 and 23. We've been given the example and we are to follow in His steps, not our own, but His way. Three things Peter points out about our Savior is one, don't deceive. Don't deceive. Here's what he says exactly. Peter reminds us in verse 22 that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, quote, never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. Now, let me ask you a question. Can we never sin ever? Can we? Can we go the rest of our life and never ever do anything wrong or make a mistake? We're flesh. But I can tell you this. We can go the rest of our life and never deceive anyone. We can go the rest of our life and, 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 and truly, truly, if you, if you think about it, in uh, verse 22, he never sinned. The only part of that verse that we can do, we can't never sin. Because we sin. We're sinners. Saved by the grace of God, and yes, He paid the price. He did it for us. But we can live not, not deceiving people. This is one example He was and is for us. Secondly, don't retaliate. I know this was tough. It's tough for me just as much as it is tough for you, man. This is one that, hey, you don't understand what they did. You're right, I don't. Neither does anybody else. You don't understand what they did. We think it's going to make us feel good to get back at them. When honestly, at the end, it really makes us feel horrible. Because as we talk about in the Scriptures, remember, if other people depict our actions, I promise you, when everything's over and said and done, you're going to remember that you acted because of that person. You're going to know that you acted not because of God, but because of man. And it will eat away at you and eat away at you and eat away at you and eat away at you. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you at. He wants us to thank God or retaliate. We, we soon forget. Peter reminds us that Jesus never retaliated. Never. Nor did he threaten revenge when he suffered. So, can we be another place like Jesus right here? You doggone right we can. We, can, we never have to retaliate. We can go through the rest of our life and not retaliate against somebody else, can't we? Yes. It's called Discipline. Something that God wants us to be as Christians. Disciplined Christians. You want disciplined children, right? So does God. So does God. <clears throat> he trusted His Father. Romans 12, 19 says this, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. What's God's anger? It's what? Righteous. It's right, okay? God's anger is right. He has a right anger. He doesn't come with the anger you and I have. He doesn't come angry against people just, to, just because we're mad with them. He comes because it's a just anger. It's right. And then it repeats Deuteronomy from the Scriptures in the Old Testament. I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. My friend, I can promise you something and then it never comes true. But the Word of God is a promise. It is always true. So if he says this, I will pay them back, says the Lord, I will take revenge, says the Lord. He will. He will. He will. Trust he will. One way or another. One way or another. Oh, the, the worst enemy you and I could ever have is Satan. And you know what? Honestly, I really hope I am there. I really hope so bad I'm standing there. When at the great white throne judgment, man, he gets cast into the lake of fire forever. When the Lord looks at him and says, You couldn't get these in my people. They didn't serve you. The worst enemy of all. If you, if you think about that, the worst enemy we got is, 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 is Satan. And so many times we think it's people. It's not. It's not. Honestly, when people come against you and I, it's not them. It's 
the evil spirit that lives in them. Or just controlling them. Or me and you when we do that to someone. We wrong somebody. It's their evil, the evil spirit of the enemy that we're allowing to use us to wrong somebody else. Yeah, it hurts. It cuts like a knife. Brian Adams had it right. Some of y'all young people wouldn't know that. Y'all know Brian Adams cuts like a knife. Y'all remember that song? Y'all are so happy. Y'all babies would look more grew in that one. Get it right. It's tough. Life's tough. We don't have to retaliate. Our Father has righteous anger, not like ours. He will deliver justice always. We do not have to retaliate. Lastly, how did Jesus do? The same as telling us, don't handle it yourself. Don't handle it yourself. I understand the cliche, so does God, that says, you know what, if you want something done right, come on. Do it yourself, yeah. You want something done right? Do it yourself. I understand the old cliche, but let me say something to you this morning to change that for our, you and me and all of us. If we want something done right, leave it to God. Leave it to God because He's perfect. He's perfect. Trust God. The Scripture tells us in verse 23, He left His case in the hands of God. Is exactly what that Scripture did. exactly what Jesus did. And so what is Peter telling us? To live just this way. Live as the example of Christ. Live as the example that he did. Don't deceive. Don't retaliate. Don't handle it on yourself. Don't think that you can overcome this and thanks God. Because you can overcome and I can overcome nothing of my own. Only with him. Will we ever, ever be able to overcome this? Lastly, live in peace. And this is a tough one. It's a tough one. Man, our world is so jacked up and messed up. There's no peace. And really, you turn on the TVs and things, there's no peace anywhere around, is it? So it's, it's easy to say that, but here's the thing. How can we live in peace in such a nasty, dirty, rotten world? Two simple things I think that he's telling us this morning. I believe he's taught me and shown me. He paid it. That's how. That's how. I was sharing with Nick and and we were yesterday, you know, and, and, and as God opened up, I, was, I shared the scripture with him yesterday, and, and as God opened my eyes to it again, I was like, dog, it's amazing how you can read. So I've been studying the scripture all week long. And all of a sudden yesterday it hit me, and I was like, woo, yeah. I changed the title of the sermon yesterday. God changed it. I had to put it in my phone because we're getting old, and I was like, oh, hold on, man, let me put it in my phone. So Nick comes in this morning, he's like, hey, did you want to change the title? I go up there and change it and everything, and I was like, dude, I can't even remember what the title is. What I talked about yesterday. Hold on, let me go back and check my phone. Thank God for notes. <laughs> Here's the thing. He paid the sin debt for our souls and for our sakes. Notice in verse 24 exactly what Peter says. I want to go back to that. I'm going to go back to it real quick. Notice in verse 24 what he says. He left his case after that, verse 24. Somebody can read it with me. Where are we at? He personally what? Let's read that together. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. Now I want to point out something to you. There's a key word there. It's only two letters. He personally carried our sins in his body. You ever thought about this? Oh, he carried our sin dead to the cross. No, he carried it in his body. He was sinless. He was perfect. And He carried our sin to inside of Him. You understand this? Here's the thing. This is where it meets. This is where the big thing of the whole Scripture is If you miss anything else, don't miss this. He took all of your sin and my sin and He put it inside Himself and He died on the cross for us so that when He died in His flesh and body, so did sin die. We forget it. We forget it. We let the enemy distract us. We let the enemy get us, get us discouraged. We let, we let things in life come in against us. We live in no peace because we forgot that Jesus killed sin. It's dead. If for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus. How is that? Because He killed it. He killed it. Not just that it was within him and inside him. 
so that we can be dead to sin and live. Man. I don't understand how to witness to somebody. Real simple. If you understand that Jesus Christ took your debt and my debt and put it inside of Him, all the nastiness, and He was perfect, but yet He took all the imperfection, and it died with Him, forget. Why did He do it? Because He would have done it just for me. He'd have done it just for you. Took it inside of you and killed it. I want to submit to you something this morning. He took it inside of you and committed suicide for me and you. Now you think of it like that. He knew he was going to die. Right? And he still did it. He could have stopped it at any time. Right or wrong. for me and you. So when Jesus' fleshly body died on the cross, our sin died too. Only if you fully surrender just as He did. I mean, see, here's the key. You don't just, you don't just get it. Salvation ain't cheap. Oh, it's, it was free, free gift. Oh, it's a free gift. It cost everything. It cost him his life. And there's a part of us on this earth that's still here that he made a promise to us. How can we act? And how can we live in peace? And how can we how can we act like him? How can we live in the situation we're living in? How can we live as example of Jesus? How can we live really in peace? One, because he paid it, and two, because he guards our soul. He paid the debt for our soul. That's it. He paid it, the debt for our soul. He guards it, our soul. Period. As Peter says in verse, verse 25, we used to be like sheep, wandering aimlessly, and I quote to you, but now you have turned to your shepherd, capital S, the guardian of your souls. Our Lord paid our debt, and he guards our souls. Thank God he guarded my soul for 27 years until I surrendered. Thank God he did. Praise his holy name that he didn't take my, my life was not taken and I would have died and gone to hell before I was 27 years old. Before I fully surrendered and said, hey God, I'm yours, man. Whatever you want me to be, I'll be. Whatever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Surrender. Don't, don't come down and say a little prayer. Don't get in the baptistry and get baptized and, and, and think that that's salvation. It's not. I heard, I heard it recently, and it's true. What is baptism? Why do we believe in baptism? It's because Jesus did. We want to be like Him. He was baptized by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist said, no, I need to be baptized by you. And he was like, no, this is right. You have to do what my Father requires. Why? Because He was setting an example for us. So what is baptism? I've heard people say many times, I say to people, I'm like, okay, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I've been baptized. That's not what I asked you. People get so mixed up in it because we as church and the body of Christ have sold false religion for so long and concentrated on baptism more than baptism more than we concentrate on people's salvation. Because what is baptism? It's just like your wedding ring. It's a symbol. Of an outward expression of what God's done inside of you. What is your wedding ring? It's an outward symbol outward symbol of a relationship that God put together. Same thing, right? It's not salvation. We've got to understand what it is. He saved our souls. What does He want us to do? Fully surrender. He paid a debt for us to surrender to. Not fight it ourselves. Not overcome it ourselves because we never win. Not to take it upon our own shoulders. You never live in peace that way, neither will I. You gotta do this. Take that off. And let him take it. Let him take it. So let us remember today, live in the situation. No matter what the situation is, God already knows. He already knows what situation you're going through. Nobody knows what I'm dealing with. Oh yes, they do, he does. Scriptures don't lie. 
And the scripture says he experienced every emotion you and I have ever had. He knows. He knows. He walks with you. He walks with me. We can focus on the negative things that happen in our life, or we can turn and focus on the positive. I know you've heard that a million times. We need to hear it a million more. So that we understand that no matter in our situation, God already knows it. He's already in control of it. If you allow Him to be in control of it, if you really give it to Him and not take it back on your own, it's easy to take it back on our own. I promise you, it's really easy. It's hard to give it to Him and really trust. Even though He's gone. No matter what the situation is, God already knows. Live as the example. The example is who? Jesus Christ. He's already shown us how to live. He's shown us. Not like anybody else. Not, not by the ministry of anybody else. And can I remind you of something? Talking about preaching and all this stuff or anything. Does anyone think there was ever a greater preacher than Jesus? And he lived about 33 and a half years, right? And his ministry didn't even start until he was 30. So for about three and a half years, at the end of that three and a half years, how many followers, true followers, did he really have? About 100, 120. I'm not knocking it and everything either. I don't believe that anything I have inside me that Jesus was a mega church guy. I don't. I don't believe he was about numbers. I believe he was about quality. Surrendering. Man, I'm patting my ministry after Billy Graham. I've heard so many times. I've said it. I've said it before. Man, I want to be like Jensen Frank. I want to be a priest like that dude. Man, I want to be in a church like that. Man, it's so cool. I bet he don't have to worry about nothing. He got to deal with half the headaches. I guarantee you. He don't have to worry about whether the band's fixed or whether the, the light bulbs are out or whether the toilet's got to be got to be unstopped or whether 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 the grass has got to be cut or whether whether weeds got to be killed or all that stuff. He don't have to worry about none of that. All that dude's got to do is preach. Man, I sure wish I could be like him. No, I don't. I really wish I could be like Jesus. He's the example. Or we want to be like somebody else today or we want to be like Jesus. I can't answer that. Only you can. For you. I know my answer. God knows my answer. So the example is Jesus and he's already showing us how to live in last living peace. In the peace that Jesus has paid it all and he controls our future. Not man. It's a praise man come this time. That, that should, that's shouting to you right there. Let me read that to you one more time just so you understand what I just said. Okay? Listen to me. In the peace that Jesus has paid it all and he controls our future. Not man. He does. Yeah, you should, that should be shouting. You should be excited. The fact that you, me, nobody else controls our future. He is the only one that controls our future. That's why he's the only one we got to please. My mama can't get me into heaven. And because she's saved, I don't mean I'm saved. I used to work with a guy whose dad was a preacher. And he told me he knew he was going to heaven because his daddy was a pastor. He knew he was going to heaven because his pastor down generation to generation. Dude, are you smoking crack? Have you read your Bible? You're the PK and you, you don't read your Bible. You know them PKs are the worst ones anyway. Why? Because they hang out with other leaders' kids. <laughs> Warps them. They're all warped. <laughs> Church kids, period. So when life is tough, as you stand to your feet this morning, when life is tough and we're mistreated or we're treated unfairly, we must live in all things just as Jesus has shown us to live. He's our pattern to live by, and just as He did, we must realize that no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, we place everything, everything, everything in His hands. That's what the last was supposed to say, my fault. That was my original title. No matter what, it's all good, though. I love you, man. No matter what, either way, place it all in his hands. No matter what, 
No matter how bad it is, no matter how, how great it may be, no matter what, give it to Him. He is worthy. He is trustworthy. He's more than capable. He already killed something you and I could have never killed and never will kill. It's dead. It's dead. But my friends, I want to tell you something this morning. Our faith without works is dead too. He called us to work. Not to be lazy, not to sit around, not to think, oh, everything's going to be fine, everything's going to just be good, and we just get through life and skim through another. Not good enough. Not good enough. He wants the best. He don't settle for anything else. Not your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your wife, your husband, your sister, your brother, your mom, your dad, your, your friends. None of that. None of that ever, ever, ever will do anything for your life more than what God will do. Remember that. No matter what.